Welcome to the American Lung Association webcast, Standing Order for Tobacco Cessation. Sound is being streamed through your computer speakers. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A chat box. I am now pleased to hand the conference over to Ruth Kenobi. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, welcome. I um, really appreciate um, you all being here. We're, we're thrilled to be hosting this webcast today to highlight the work being done in Indiana regarding standing orders for tobacco cessation. You should have already received a case study that we did on this, um, but if you haven't had the opportunity to review it or see it, we will be sending it out as part of our follow-up. Um, I think you will learn a great deal about Indiana's experience and how other states might explore some of these options for expanding access to tobacco cessation. We really do appreciate your participation in this webcast, and we recognize that so many of you in public health have um, increased workloads, and, and we also want to acknowledge that um, with these times, most, if not all of us, are working from home. So please excuse any background noises from our new coworkers, be it children, dogs, cats, loud neighbors, etc. So um, we really, we really appreciate people's um, willingness to be here, and I'm excited to learn. So if we could go to the next slide. Great. Um, and so today, these are our facilitators for today's webcast. Um, as introduced, I'm Ruth Kenobi with the American Lung Association, Claire Brockbank and Michelle Paterino of Segway Consulting, um, who have really worked extensively on the case study, will help give us some background on the issue and guide us through our later conversation. Claire and Michelle have extensive experience and a real expertise in healthcare issues, including tobacco coverage issues. And then next slide. These are some of the people who helped us really understand the policies we're going to highlight in the case study, and um, they will also serve as our panelists that we'll be hearing from later in the call, and we'll tell you a, a little bit about them as we move along. If we go, go to the next slide, um, this is the agenda for our call today. As a reminder, the case study is accessible on our website, but will be sent to you as well. Claire from Segway will be laying the groundwork for why we are covering this topic, share an ov overview of the case study, and then we really will spend a significant time talking with the panel to learn more about their experiences. As mentioned, please feel free to submit your questions throughout the call using the Q&A box. We'll do our best to get to all of your questions. Um, but before we get started kind of beyond these logistics, we did want to take the opportunity to highlight some additional good tobacco cessation work that Indiana is doing kind of beyond this case study, this work. Um, we recently heard the exciting news that Indiana Medicaid has removed all copays for tobacco cessation medications. Um, it's a strong, positive move removing that copay, which can be a cost barrier to cessation um, assistance. And so we're excited about that and just wanted to take the opportunity to highlight it um, as an important work that's being done in Indiana. If we could go to the next slide. Um, as part of our work, we are working to ensure that we offer what we offer is a value, and so we want to make sure um, what we're doing is, is helpful to you all. So if we could just have a quick polling question, if you could do that, that would be great. And we're curious, kind of what's your current level of knowledge about standing orders for tobacco cessation medications? And so I'll give folks a, a few minutes to do that, and then we can... the results. Okay, great. Um, and so hopefully we can see this here. Thank you so much for participating. And then, so with that, I am pleased to pass this along to Claire Brockbank of Segway Consulting, who will provide some background information and help set the stage for our conversation with our panelists today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, I'm going to assume everyone can hear me, so we'll just keep moving. I'm going to provide an overview, sort of a little bit, um, an explanation of why the case study and the moving parts of the case study. We want to keep a good bit of the time for more of a roundtable discussion. 
Um, many of the uh, resources and experts I'll talk about during it are on the phone with us today, which is really fantastic. So it's always better to hear directly from um, the folks who have this deep level of expertise. So we'll start with um, some background on um, what's going on on the federal level, even though most of our discussion will be about state activity. Um, we'll talk about the rationale for an expanded role for pharmacists. We'll spend some time talking about different types of pharmacists. And then we'll jump into some of the um, other additional case study information. So all of you, of course, know that um, using medication um, helps people um, quit more successfully or more likely to have them quit. So one of the things that's important, even though we've seen states working on, um, on tobacco and engaging pharmacists for, for a couple of decades, um, it's become more prevalent in the last several years. Because of the importance of, of CMS at the federal level to state Medicaid programs, um, we were particularly um, glad to see a bulletin that was released in early 2017 by CMS that basically provided guidance to states on ways to um, improve access to medications by using pharmacists. This guidance wasn't specific to tobacco. Um, it also covered some of the opioid medications, a number of different medications, but it basically indicated that CMS was on board for it and it gave, um, it gave first some additional momentum. And so um, that as context for what the states are doing um, is, was extraordinarily helpful. So one of the first questions um, that we get asked is, why pharmacists? Why would you, why, why, why are they an important, an important entity? And there's basically, there's a lot of reasons, but we're gonna sum, about, sum them up into four categories. So one is access. We know that 90% um, of Americans live within five miles of a pharmacy. Um, and that can't be said the same for access to other providers and facilities. Um, counter that to it takes an average of um, a little over 29 days um, back in 2017 to see a family um, physician. Um, those numbers have not improved in the last couple of years. And so if someone is motivated to quit, the pharmacist is a very accessible point of reference. Pharmacists are cost effective. Um, the data, the evidence-based data shows that the um, pharmacists had a lower mean cost um, per quit and a higher number of verified carbon monoxide verified quits. So um, it, it's, again, both cost effective and good outcomes. Um, training is important. And Dr. Hedman can talk about this later, but uh, pharmacists are one of the few clinical professions that have a national effort to make sure that everybody is trained in tobacco cessation. So right now, almost 99% of pharmacists receive some level of training, some significant level of training in tobacco cessation. Um, and so, so there is already a, a sort of a deep culture of understanding. And as I said, patient outcomes are good. And in the years that different states have had standing orders, no, no negative quality, um, quality consequences. So one of the things that, um, that, that we had to get our arms around, and, and again, our panelists can talk a little bit more about it if you're curious, um, is, is a pharmacist is not a pharmacist is not a pharmacist. So all pharmacists are clinical. They all receive clinical training. They're all geared towards trying to help patients get the best possible outcomes for their medi medications. But there is, when you look at the on the outpatient side, there's dispensing and non-dispensing pharmacists. And you'll hear this will become important as we continue talking. Um, a dispensing pharmacist is what you may think about as the person behind the counter at the pharmacy. And they are, in addition to giving that kind of clinical guidance, they are actually filling and dispensing um, prescriptions. A non-dispensing pharmacist might work in a um, with a clinical practice in a clinic um, with a doctor's group, and they are providing pharmacy um, counsel and expertise, but they are not behind the counter filling prescriptions. Um, there's independent pharmacists versus chain pharmacies. Um, that's probably more intuitive. And we see pharmacists in clinics and doctor's offices, of course, as well as behind the counter. So it's super important because as you look at different standards in different states or think about it in your state, um, these different differences matter. So when we think about the different models to provide more autonomous pharmacist prescribing, 
Um, they, there's lots of different nuances, but they all basically fall into four um, general camps. Uh, and moving from uh, sort of left to right, um, on, the, on the far end of the spectrum, number one is collaborative practice agreements. Those are right now in place in 49 states and the District of Columbia. And they basically allow a pharmacist to, to, to create an agreement with a specific clinical practice, a doctor, a group of doctors, whatever, about what that pharmacist can do on behalf of that physician's patients, what they can prescribe, what they can't prescribe, et cetera. So on the one hand, that is the most pervasive, but it is a one at a time arrangement. It's very, very difficult to scale. And it takes time to do, and neither pharmacists or physicians, it's a very time consuming process. Um, on the, the second, moving farther down the spectrum, you have standing orders. And that is when um, a state designates a prescriber for all tobacco prescriptions. So that, that prescriber, that single provider prescriber might be a, um, the state medical director, the head of the, de the Department of Health, uh, but it's one entity. The pharmacist fills that prescription, so knows that there's this blanket prescription and the pharmacist can fill it, um, but the, it's not the pharmacist who's doing the prescribing. So as a result, the pharmacist can't fill for other services provided with it. So in, Ohio, in Indiana, it's Dr. Block who signs the prescriptions, and so a pharmacist can't bill for services that Dr. Block didn't provide, so counseling, et cetera. So, um, so again, it, it's great for access, but, but there is that limitation. The statewide protocol is very similar, except that the prescriber is the actual pharmacist in who is filling the prescription. So um, the person comes in and the, the pharmacist walks through any, any dialogue or discussion and then it's his or her name on the prescription. There are currently five states that allow that. Um, now it's important to know that from a patient's perspective, from a tobacco user's perspective, this looks almost, this is almost non-meaningful to them. It, it's more how this process is structured. For the patient, it means that when they go in, they can talk to their pharmacist, the pharmacist can ask them questions and, um, and, and, and guide them towards tobacco cessation medications. The fourth one um, really says instead of having legislation um, or um, authorities that say who's the prescriber, it really says let's, let's make tobacco specific prescriptive authority embedded in the pharmacist's scope of practice. So it comes from a different place, if you will. So this is um, embedded right in the pharmacy scope of practice. It doesn't, it doesn't come through this other process. Again, for the patient, it looks quite similar. Um, but for the pharmacist, it's quite different. So again, we're happy to answer questions as we move along. So, so now we know sort of why you would use pharmacists, some of the different models. Um, to think about in terms of how to engage pharmacists, what are the components that you would normally think about or you'd want to think about as you, as you um, look at this or assess your own, your own opportunities? Um, typically, we see five, five components across most of them with variations on the theme. So the first is the, the protocols typically specify what medications. On one end is simply NRT. That could be OT, over-the-counter NRT, to prescription NRT, all the way to all FDA-approved drugs. Um, the research does seem to indicate that including all FDA-approved drugs is a more powerful, effective mechanism. We'll talk about that more later. Um, but again, we see variation on that. Um, we do see some states like California who started with just NRT now moving towards expanding it to include all of the drugs, particularly once the the Eagle study was completed on Varenicline and the, the, the box labeling came off. Counseling refers to the, the interface between the pharmacist and the tobacco user. And it can be as simple as Colorado, which just requires a referral to the quit line, all the way to New Mexico, which includes a 90-minute educational program and mandatory follow-up, and all points in between. 
Um, minimum education and minimum education and training requirements. That's fairly self-explanatory. And again, Karen Hudman, who sort of wrote the book on this, is is on our roundtable. Um, so we'll we'll let her address that as questions arise. Um, notification to primary care provider. This is somewhat self-explanatory too. Some require that the primary care provider be notified. Some recommend it. Some have specific forms. It sort of goes along the spectrum. Um, and finally, record keeping. Um, all pharmacists keep records of the of the medications they've prescribed. Some have more detail regarding um, how long things have to be kept and what needs to be kept and, and handed along. So those are what would be included in a standing order, a statewide protocol, however you go about doing it. And I should stress that our conversation um, from that picture of the model um, that we just looked at a, a minute ago, this one, Everything that we're going to talk about from here forth and what the, the case study emphasizes is options two, three, and four. So let's jump into Indiana's standing order. I've mentioned Colorado and I've mentioned New Mexico and some of the other states that have standing orders, but the case study um, really focuses um, more specifically on Indiana's. Um, because they're still in process, and that's, it's always useful to be able to, to um, watch it unfold. Um, so the legislation passed in Indiana in 2017. The protocol went into effect in August of 2019. Um, there were a couple key stakeholders that, um, that are important to mention. One was the Indiana Pharmacists Association, which worked closely with their national association. Um, NASPA has some great resources on their website. Those are described a little in the case study. And then um, Indiana was very fortunate to have Purdue University's College of Pharmacy in the state, and they were actively involved also. So it was um, awesome to have subject matter ex um, experts engaged. They would say it was also important that they engaged many other stakeholders in the process, but these were key experts that um, really um, really uh, were instrumental in having this happen. Um, it's been in place for six to eight months, so they're still gathering results, um, but so far they're, um, they're pleased with how it's played out, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. So what does their standing order include? So we talked about um, the medications. They have all FDA-approved medications in their list. And this was actually a discussion that happened with the medical society who initially was concerned about it. And they shared they had a lot of dialogue about quality and outcomes, et cetera, and so um, agreed to some quality reporting parameters. And that brought everyone on board with including all of the FDA-approved medications. From a counseling perspective, um, they, um, they authorized pharmacists, they asked pharmacists to assess a patient's readiness to quit. Um, to provide a clinical um, health screening based on the guidelines um, and to counsel the patient on the different options. Um, they do, um, are required to provide follow-up and they have to inform the patient that they should follow up with their PCP. Um, they have documentation that they can provide either to the patient to share with the PCP or that the patient can ask be sent directly to the PCP. So in terms of that follow-up, um, theirs is a, a sort of a gentle in-between, right? They really want the um, tobacco user to engage with their PCP, but they make it as easy as possible. So a couple of successes, and um, we'll also talk about challenges um, on, on, um, on this slide. Um, successes. One of the things that was really um, fantastic about this was that it really allowed pharmacists to work at the top of their license and to work closely with pharmacists to make sure that it didn't interfere with existing workflows, which can be very difficult to have a profession change. Right now, in this time of COVID, I think we're seeing a real explosion of interest, creativity, alternative strategies for improving access to people. Um, and not always through the traditional make an appointment, go see your doctor route. And so this effort to allow pharmacists to work at their top at the top of their practice, um, I think the timing on it was 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 terrific. And I think it'll um, with what we're seeing as as the nature of our our practice and our interface with clinicians changes, this is something that we'll see emphasized more and more 
and certainly not specific only to tobacco. Uh, again, I talked a little bit about all FDA approved medications. Um, that this was definitely what they would consider an important success factor. Um, the strong relationship between stakeholders. Again, we talked a little bit at the beginning about the stakeholders that were involved right from the beginning, but they also um, engaged actively with other stakeholders, from physicians to Medicaid to um, independent pharmacists and chain pharmacists, et cetera. So that building that relationship and making it clear that um, everybody shared this goal of tobacco cessation was an important, um, was an important uh, baseline. They also included out-of-state patients. And so the reason this is important is that, you know, with the exception of Hawaii and Alaska, all states share borders. And typically, often practice patterns and flows don't honor a state border per se. And so the ability to not turn someone away because they live just across the border. Um, I'm in Colorado, and the, a lot of people in Wyoming come right into northern Colorado to get their care and vice versa. And so you don't want to limit, limit that. They also, um, had, because they'd worked actively with the independent pharmacists, they felt that there were several that were really on board um, to implement almost as soon as the order was effective, and that was great. Um, the companion challenge to that was that it takes a lot longer for large pharmacy chains um, to put implement standing orders, and it's important to recognize why. Um, Every state's standing orders are slightly different, and so for a chain like CBS or Kroger or Walmart, um, they have to integrate potentially 50 different protocols, and so that creates some, um, some lag time and sometimes some reluctance. So um, that's just a reality that you should keep in mind. Um, a couple of other challenges that came up in Indiana, um, their language uses the term dispense. And when I was talking about why that matters, um, inadvertently, and this was a last minute language situation, um, inadvertently the term dispense was used, which means that um, pharmacists who are in clinical work um, are not in a position to be able to engage in this um, clinical work behind with a, a, a medical practice as opposed to a direct affiliation with a, a pharmacy behind a counter, if you will, um, it makes it difficult for them to engage in this process. Um, they are in the midst of changing that language, but this is why the looking at dispense, some, some states talk about furnishing medications, and we go through some of those details in the case study. The other thing that, um, that the health department in Indiana raised as a challenge that they encountered they weren't really thinking about um, billing issues when they put this in place. They were really thinking about access, and Indiana has a very high tobacco use rate. But a couple things came up. One was this issue I talked about where um, if you're a, a chain and you want to provide counseling also, um, you can't bill the insurance company because the prescription is under Dr. Box's name. So we, we've, um, we've We've been informed that some of the chains charge cash to the patient for their counseling. Um, the other barrier that comes up around the finances, if you will, is the Medicaid drug rebate program. So if these are Medicaid patients, um, the Medicaid drug rebate program specifies what drugs, and there, have, there are situations where um, it's pretty easy to be on the Medicaid drug list. But if you are a Kroger or a pharmacist that is pharmacy that has created some white labeled um, medications that, that are labeled, you know, King Supers brand um, NRT, that might be the least expensive. But if it's not on the list, um, the Medicaid drug rebate program list, the, the tobacco user may not end up having it covered. The good news is pharmacists are pretty well versed in this and they know it, but it has been a bit of a snafu at times. Um, for the Indiana, um, Indiana program. So with that, that was a lot of information um, in one fell swoop. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michelle Paterino, and she's going to facilitate um, answer the question and answer period. So Michelle, take it away. Thanks, Claire. Um, so it looks like most of you have uh, figured, well, not most of you, many of you have figured out where the Q&A box is. So 
We've got some questions coming in. We totally appreciate that. Um, first, I want to introduce you to our panel. And here they are. Um, I'm happy to uh, let you know who these folks are. They were all instrumental in the development of this case study. Um, and uh, two of them were involved in what Indiana was able to do on the ground as well. So um, first, many of you know Ann Julio, who's the National Director of Lung Health Policy at the American Lung Association. Um, Ann really helped Claire and I to understand the context of the work in Indiana um, and help us, helped us with introductions. She, in fact, introduced us to Allie Jo Shipman, who is our second panelist. Allie Jo is a pharmacist joining us from Virginia. She's the director of state policy for the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations. So she helps state pharmacy associations and their members understand state policy trends and innovations um, by doing research and resource development. She focuses primarily on issues related to scope of practice and payment for par pharmacists and um, patient care services. And before Ali Jo was at um, NASPA, she was the Associate Director of State Government Affairs for the National Community Pharmacists Association. So she's done a lot of work in this space, and we are very pleased to have Ali Jo with us. Our second um, subject matter expert who was on the ground in Indiana as well um, is Karen Hudman. Karen is also a pharmacist and a tobacco treatment specialist. Um, she's a professor of pharmacy practice at Purdue University College of Pharmacy, and she's a clinical professor at the University of California San Francisco School of Pharmacy. Um, as a uh, cancer prevention researcher, um, Karen has 30 years of tobacco research experience, and she's personally provided tobacco cessation training to more than 25,000 health professionals. So she's done a lot of the work that we all talk about in our state roles. Um, Karen was one of the original authors of the Rx for Change Clini Clinician Assisted Tobacco Cessation Training Program, which has been around since 1999, and it's used across the globe to train students and clinicians to use evidence-based approaches to help patients um, quit. So um, Karen currently has research that has been funded by the Indiana State Department of Health and also the NIH. Um, and Karen, I think starting with your background, I just want to, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you and then we'll, we'll take a look. Many are coming in, but um, Karen, can you tell us a little bit about the education that pharmacists get during their training and then tell us how the work that you're doing is supplementing that, um, since that's one of the things that we highlighted in the case study that's available to states now. Sure, absolutely. So back in 1999, we, meaning our team at the University of California, San Francisco, and a couple other schools of pharmacy in California, developed a tobacco cessation training program because we identified a huge gap in the training, not just of pharmacists, but others had already identified it in other health disciplines. And so being the leading cause of preventable death, we thought we need to fill this hole in their training. So we designed a shared curriculum, and it was really designed to be just that. Everybody can use it. We keep it updated. It's out on the web. If you need to teach it, just go download the materials and voila, you don't have to update a single slide. And so we put that out on the web in 2004 and more than 15 years ago, and we've kept it updated ever since then. And then we had an NIH grant that funded for five years. We trained faculty at schools of pharmacy across the country, and 98% of the schools attended the Train the Trainer program, and like 85% actually implemented Rx for Change. And then 15 years later, we conducted a national survey with the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, and this was actually commissioned by the CDC to determine what was going on in pharmacy with respect to tobacco cessation. So we conducted a national survey and found out that about three-quarters of the schools of pharmacy, and we had almost a 50% increase in the number of schools over that period of time, um, but about 75% of the schools of pharmacy are still using these con this content that we created and have made available. And so we've been updating it. It's a resource that's, that's been around for a while, and it's not just pharmacy. It's used in all health disciplines, um, every state in the country, and I think 94, uh, every state in the U.S. and 94 countries globally use these materials that are shared and externally reviewed as well, and no industry funding. So it's all been funded by the NIH, and more specifically the National Cancer Institute. And so from that, um, we've had other uh, NIH grants where we developed virtual patients for tobacco cessation. We developed standardized patients and OSCEs, which is used to assess students' competencies 
search of acquisition cessation, and most recently, the most you know really relevant to this grant or this discussion is the grant that we just received in September, which was funded early by the National Cancer Institute, and this was um, to work with the states basically. And Indiana is the pilot state, and admittedly, we're moving a little slow because we can't get to filming for our. It, and I'm telling you, the the programming that we're creating is going to be like Academy Awards CE programming. It's going to be amazing. And, um, but unfortunately, it's a little slowed because of COVID. But in the meantime, we have a program that we've made available. And within the first, what, three months, we had over 800 pharmacists complete it. And um, so we're t developing a two and a half hour web based program for pharmacists, a six hour web based program for pharmacists. And the difference there is that the briefer one will have pharmacists you know, help to select and dispense the medications. Um, and then they will refer patients to other resources for the behavioral piece, which is the mostly the 1-800-QUIT-NOW, the tobacco quit line. The longer version, which is going to be kind of moving beyond the basics, will have more complicated patients, and um, it also will have a much heavier dose of the behavioral counseling piece. And so Frank Vitale, who actually taught me everything I know about tobacco cessation, um, is the best speaker and really one of the best counselors in the country, and he, he's um, helping to develop this content as well for the behavioral piece. And so if you want to do comprehensive tobacco cessation counseling, including the behavioral piece, you would do the longer program. And so these are going to be available on the web, but we're also going to be doing live training when the country opens back up. And so we also know from the work of Robin Corelli and Lisa Kroon at the University of California and some of our own work uh, working in the state of Washington and Connecticut that the technician is absolutely essential to this whole process in the community pharmacy. And so we're developing a 30-minute web-based training for technicians. So pharmacists that want to implement tobacco cessation services under their statewide protocol or standing order, they will have they can train their pharmacists as, or their technicians as well to ask about tobacco use, advise patients to quit, and refer patients who are interested in quitting to them, the pharmacists, for additional counseling or to the tobacco quit line, which is well within their scope of practice as a technician. So again, there'll be brief, brief trainings, two and a half hour, longer six hours for pharmacists will be live and web-based, and then there'll be a 30-minute technician training that'll be web-based, and all of this will be at no cost, and it will have CE attached to it also at no cost. So yay for the National Cancer Institute, because they've been just amazing in funding this work and down this line. And you know, my colleague Robin Crowley and I always laugh. In the early days, we had to basically drag people out of the halls to get them to come in for tobacco cessation <laughs> education, but now it's like people flood in. So I think it's just great. It's taken a while. Um, but we're getting there. Thank you, Karen. And I just want to point out to everyone on the phone that if you look at um, the case study itself, you will see Karen's uh, contact information there so that you can reach out to her if your state is working on this as well and you have some training questions. So um, thanks again for allowing us to, to uh, do that, um, Karen, and provide that access. So um, second, Ali Joe, I'm going to turn to you. We have a question um, that came in about whether legislation is required to allow a standing order in the state, or um, are there other mechanisms to do that? Sure, thank you. So most of the time, yes, a, a legislation will be required for a standing order or a statewide protocol um, or changing it to um, just within the scope of practice of a pharmacist in the Pharmacy Practice Act. Um, there are a couple of states where it's they've already implemented something a little more broad, they already have a process in place to allow for statewide protocols, so um, if one of those states already has that, then they can already use the process that's there. Um, but for the majority of states, yes, you would need legislation um, in order to allow for uh, a statewide protocol or a standing order um, change. Thank you. Um, and the third question that I want to pose uh, to both of you, um, but we'll, we'll start with you, Karen, uh, because Claire alluded to the fact that, uh, that you've got um, some data and some passion around this issue. Uh, we've seen some emails from states that are interested in standing orders as a way to allow their quit line to help tobacco users uh, with the counseling, but then send them to a pharmacy um, so that they can use their insurance benefits to get their pharmacotherapy. Um, and there has been some debate in some of those emails about using uh, a standing order for NRT or a standing order for all the FDA-approved medications. So, um, Karen, you want to start us off on that conversation? 
Absolutely, and I, I'll just warn you, I have very strong feelings about this, and I won't hold back. Um, if you're going to go this route in your state, you must include all medications, not just NRT, meaning the nicotine, the medications that have nicotine in them. You definitely want to include infrarenicline, and you should also include bupropion SR. Even though it doesn't get as much use, it is a first-line medication. And we know from the EAGLE study that varenicline, in terms of monotherapy, is the most effective. And it's easy to use. You know, it's a pill. People like taking pills, right? It's easier than nasal sprays and inhalers and other things. So um, evidence tells us right now what we know, varenicline and combination nicotine replacement therapy are the most effective. And we should just stop using, unless there's a very good reason, anything else that is is a form of treatment, at least it's, it's a starting point. So go with the evidence. And we were very clear in Indiana. In fact, I went so far as to say, if we are not including all medications, then this is a non-starter because it's not worth our time. You know, we can recommend the over-the-counter meds, um, you know, the patch, the gum, the lozenge right now. We don't need anything to do that. But to add the nasal spray and the inhaler, which are hardly ever used, um, they're not as palatable to the patient, and they cost a lot, and they're short-acting. And to use them, it's, it's just not, it's not going to move the needle at all. And we've shown this in data with California um, that we're evaluating claims data from their med one of their Medicaid groups, um, even when they have completely no restrictions, and pharmacists can recommend them, um, can prescribe them, or they call furnish in the state of California. It just doesn't change anything. So we need to include all meds, or honestly, don't waste our time. And don't say this is just a small step toward including all meds. Just go with all meds. Guess what? New Mexico has been doing this since 2004, all through the box warning period. And you know what? Not a single reported incident. So go with the data, ask for all meds, or don't waste your time. Thanks, Karen. Um, Ali Jo, I'm going to turn back to you for a minute. There are a couple of questions here about billing. So one specific to Indiana, whether Indiana pharmacists can bill for their services, and then one just about the models that Claire went over in general and um, which ones allow pharmacists to bill. Sure. Um, and Karen might have more information on Indiana specifically as far as billing goes. Um, I will say that the models that it's it's easier to develop billing and, to, and it's, it's cleaner and simpler are those last two models where the pharmacist is the prescriber of record. Um, it just it keeps it cleaner um, where if the pharmacist is the one doing the consultation and the pharmacist is the one making the decision, then the pharmacist's name, especially, you know, if you're considering like liability purposes or anything like that, should be the name on the prescription as well. Um, and so there are, you know, most of the states that have that are able to bill use a statewide protocol um, option, I believe, or have you know just it's within their their scope of practice is like a standard of care and um, what pharmacists are able to do under their scope of practice. Um, I will, Karen. I do believe that Indiana is at least working on that payment or reimbursement if they don't already have it, even though you do have a standing order. Correct. Correct, we are. However, we can at this point, pharmacists can bill Medicaid for counseling. It's not a lot of money, but it can be done. And so, but it's just Medicaid. So, but we do, we did have legislation last year that was trying to be pushed through. I testified on behalf of that to provide for the uh, third party payers to pay pharmacists for counseling, for example, on diabetes, on tobacco, some of the more complicated things. Um, but that did not go through. But it doesn't mean we're not that we're going to stop trying because it is important. It does require kind of a change in your status as, toward um, prescriber status, and so the language of our protocol does not currently permit that because we are, as uh, Claire said correctly, we're, we're filling the prescriptions even though we're helping to select the medicines. We're filling them under the state health commissioner's name. That prescription says Dr. Chris Bach. So until it doesn't, then it, it becomes more difficult. But it's definitely a battle worth fighting, and it might take some time. But, you know, when we started this whole initiative, we knew that there were going to be challenges with reimbursement. But, you know, first sometimes you have to show that you can do the work and that you can make a difference before you go and ask for that. And so I think that, you know, the evidence that we can hopefully accrue under this NIH grant, the data that we'll be collecting, we can show kind of how to do it right. And then we need more examples. We need more states that are doing this. So, but we have to show that we can do it as well. 
one thing to have legislation, but it's an entirely different concept to actually do, to, to, to do the counseling, to take those pharmacists up to what we say is the top of our license, and somebody asks the question, what does that mean? Well, that means we're practicing not just counting by five and saying take these meds until they're gone, but really delivering a service. That's what we're trained to do in pharmacy school, applying motivational interviewing, using strategies to really help patients change their behavior, something that's much more than kind of the limited view that some people have of community pharmacy. It is a clinical practice site. Thank you, Karen. Um, mm -hmm. Allie Jo, back to you for um, a question about whether the pharmacy board started this work in Indiana um, and started towards the legislation or whether that came from somewhere else. Yeah, um, and Karen, again, for Indiana specifically might be, I do believe it, it typically starts with pharmacists in the state saying, you know, we're educated, we're trained for this, um, and we want to be able to help the patients in our community and in our area um, we see the lack of access that they have, and we want to be able to provide that. And typically, that that well comes up through the state association because those pharmacists are, you know, members of the state association, and that's kind of that advocating body for the pharmacists in the state. Um, and so, I I believe it did come up through the Indiana Pharmacists Association to begin with, but I I know in other states that others you know, other groups, other patient advocacy organizations sometimes bring it to the table, um, or at least if they aren't the ones who bring it to the table, they certainly are collaborating with, you know, the pharmacy association or the pharmacy board um, to get this across. Yeah, and I would also add, you know, like I said, this has been going on since 2004. The faculty members from the University of New Mexico that we trained in that first NIH grant where we trained faculty from all the schools of pharmacy, they went back to their state and they implemented this. They used the same training that we used to teach them, the ARC for Change, to train pharmacists to actually do this. And this was in 2004. So, I mean, they, it was really their idea. And kudos to, you know, those faculty members in Dale Tinker at the State Pharmacy Association for their really incredible work, not just doing it, but evaluating it and showing that it really does reach those patients who are underinsured or uninsured. Um, and the number, you know, if you look at the data, and, it, and some of this is actually in the report, I wanted to make sure that that was in there because it, it really calls attention to those populations that need assistance and the ability to help people at the moment when they're ready to quit, not waiting 30 days to be able to see the physician to get the prescription for Chantix. So, yeah, I think that it, it was an idea that really started in New Mexico, and so I give them full credit although it's been our vision all along that pharmacists would have a much broader role, that this has really evolved over the years. And in Indiana, it was it was a function of this last grant, you know, working with the state health department and Miranda Spitznagel and Chris Fox and sitting at the table and talking about the data, creating the argument that we need more people, all hands on deck. People are dying, and, and pharmacy can make a big difference. All the meds are here, we're available, and we're trained. And I have to say, in the initial testimony that I did in front of the Senate subcommittee, I think that the point that really kind of moved the needle with the decision, which was unanimous, was when I said, my students get nine hours of tobacco education. I said, guess how many hours students at the IU School of Medicine get? It was less than one. And then when the guy from the Indiana State Medical Association stood up to testify, one of the senators said, tell me, uh, what would you do differently that pharmacists can't do themselves, and he couldn't answer the question, right? And so people always lean on the, you know, the safety and the efficacy of the meds. Well, you know, the Eagle study kind of pushed all that aside. You know, people are dying from tobacco, not from these medications. But it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be monitored. It doesn't mean they shouldn't get help. And that's what we built into our protocol. We built in the safety net that made the physicians comfortable. And I think that's important to be able to compromise willingly on things that matter for safety and efficacy. And that's how we came to the table as the Indiana pharmacist. So Karen, um, I've got two follow-up questions from what you asked um, based on what we're seeing. The first one, um, you uh, you alluded to the Eagle study. Um, and one of the questions is about vareniclin and the side effects and whether pharmacists are trained to deal with those side effects with vareniclin. And then I do want you, uh, you both um, to talk a little bit more, and maybe Anne as well, about uh, state medical associations and their uh, role in supporting or not supporting this kind of legislation. Yes, 
So the answer is yes, we are trained. But, I mean, for example, we are not, we as pharmacists, we are not psychiatrists. I mean, if you have a patient that falls in a high-risk category, and our statewide protocol is, is crystal clear on, um, it's a standing order, but it's a protocol under standing order, it's crystal clear on who those patients are and who we need to not necessarily refer but consult with um, those specific patients. And so part of the training that we provide and in Indiana, we don't say you have to do, you know, the Purdue training, you know, slash UCSF training or anybody else's. We don't care. As long as you do a training um, and you know what you're doing. And, again, our students, like I said, mine get nine hours of tobacco education, so they're very well equipped. Um, but as long as you get training you're able to implement the protocol and you follow the protocol, then, then you're allowed to do this. And so the training we get is really focused on the clinical encounters and how you kind of navigate the different medicines to help select a specific regimen for the patient who's sitting in front of you. And so it's very clinically oriented um, in terms of how we do the training, but also in terms of how you evaluate risk and whether there's a patient who, A, you shouldn't treat at all because they need to go to their, their primary care physician, or B, they might be at risk and you just need to have a consult with them. So that's all in the protocol. And the benefit of Indiana's protocol is that there were many people who went before us, and we took all of those protocols and we built what we thought was the best, the strongest, and the safest um, for the patient. Thank you. Any other comments on um, Veronicaan? Ali Joe, do you have any feedback on that? I mean, I think the only other comment I would have with Veronicaan is just to remember that that pharmacists, regardless of where that prescription is coming from, pharmacists are counseling on that medication every day for those patients as well. And so they, they understand and they know the risks and they know they understand um, what would be best for that patient um, as the medication expert. And so really, I mean, just to, to clarify and just to agree with what Karen said, um, pharmacists are trained and they're ready to provide um, the first-line therapies, and I think that's something that's really important is instead of, you know, worrying whether or not, like, oh, our pharmacists prepare for this or they train for this, but remembering what is best for the patient and all of the evidence says that what's best for the patient would be to include varenicline. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so, Ali Joe, I'll let you, you start on the topic a little bit about medical associations, if you can, and sort of what the, the dynamic um, there has been. Uh, we know that it, it came up in Indiana, but also um, in other states there have been, you know, real successes with working with the medical associations. Yeah, absolutely. And and it it's going to vary depending on the state, right? So each state's going to be very different in how the dynamics play out. Um, but I feel like as, as long as you show them that, you know, here's the evidence, here is um, the everything to back it up and it's not we're not just pulling this out of a hat and we're not just saying we want to be able to do more 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 but pharmacists are wanting to serve their patients and serve their communities and they also want to help relieve some of the burden on physicians right now you have to remember that physicians are overburdened um, and so wanting to, to take some of those things um, to help relieve their burden that they can do that pharmacists can do to take care of those patients and really showing that Pharmacists are not trying to take over something from physicians or trying to take a physician's job, but they're saying, we want to be partners with you in the, you know, in our, our community's health and in patients' health. Um, and so that really starts that dialogue of what is best for the patient. You know, let's, let's stop with the, the scope of practice, you know, kind of nitpicky fights and territory battles, but really focus on what's best for the patient. Um, and I would say that even in those states where perhaps the state medical association or the state society for whatever reason does kind of draw a hard line in the sand and say that they're not, you know, going to listen or they don't want pharmacists to do this, when you go down to the individual average practicing physician, a lot of times they want pharmacists to be able to help. They see that benefit and they see the benefit for those patients, for their patients as well of having the pharmacist part of that team um, and, and able and willing to help anyone. As Like we've mentioned multiple times, whenever that patient is ready to quit, having that option available for them, whether that's them talking to their physician or whether that's them talking to their pharmacist. 
Thank you. And um, Karen, let me come back to you for an Indiana-specific question. How do the pharmacists uh, circle back with the PCP to let them know what has been prescribed for their patients? Yeah, so in the state of Indiana, because there are a lot of patients who don't have a PCP, we had to kind of build this into the protocol. What we did was we said, if you have a PCP, we recommend that the patient follow up with them. It's not a requirement. It's just a recommendation. And then the pharmacist within 72 hours needs to let the physician or whoever the other, whatever PCP, know what the treatment regimen was. And we've developed forms to help pharmacies implement this. So for the initial counseling, um, you know, what is the treatment regimen, what you, a fax thing you can send to the, to the physician's office to let them know what you're prescribing. And then, um, you know, then the 14, we have a 14-day follow-up that was built in as well. And that was a safety net that we, I don't want to say we compromised on it. I was okay with it. Um, you have to touch base with the patient within 14 days to make sure that the treatment regimen is going okay, and then you have a final follow-up call at the end. But, you know, every state is different with respect to what you have to do, um, but in Indiana, you do need to let the PCP know, if they have one, um, what the plan is. And if they don't, then you just give the patient some information, encourage them to get a PCP, and, and deliver the information themselves if they do that. We wanted to make sure every patient could get access. We didn't want to have a complete and total barrier saying we have to bring a physician in. So that's why we built it that way. Thank you. Um, Ali Jo, question about how you motivate pharmacists to participate in this training. Yeah, I mean, I would say a lot of pharmacists are motivated already um, or they're already trained. You know, they're ready to go. They're ready to do this. Um, I think looking at it and saying, you know, this is this is a way for you to help your patients in your community. Um, a lot of state associations and other entities, schools, kind of have, are either in the process of or already have these kind of ready-made, you know, ways answering those FAQs of how do I work, how do I get this into my workflow? How do I, you know, how do I actually operationalize this? And so um, that, I think, is, Part of it, and part of it is also making sure pharmacists in the state understand, you know, what exactly that process looks like for that state. And so that really, um, many of them, as Karen mentioned, are already trained through the schooling that they receive. And those who aren't, there are several options there. And it's almost, um, at some point, you reach that tipping point where if you're not trained, then you're just kind of holding yourself back. Um, and there's kind of that, that professional peer pressure to say, no, you should be providing this service. Thank you, Ali Jo. And um, that, I, as far as my clock says, we've got five minutes left. So, Anne, um, any questions? Is there anything that you'd like to add? So I think one thing that I think is really important, and I think, Ali Jo, you just, or I think it might have been Karen or Ali Jo, somebody just hit upon it, and I think that's one of the key things it's about removing barriers to accessing these cessation treatments, um, which is really, I think, kind of what is at the heart of the Indi of what Indiana is trying to do, um, and recognizing that while tobacco cessation medications, including the over-the-counter NRTs, are covered under most people's insurance, including most Medicaid programs, and Indiana is one of them, that needing that prescription is a barrier in and of itself, and it's kind of a structural barrier with how we deliver care and how we deliver health care in the United States. So this is really, I think, one of those ways. And it's not, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not there's challenges. And I think we've a lot of intricacies and details, which we've talked about. Um, but it's just one way to remove one of those barriers. Um, and I think that's why this is such a really great thing. Um, and I'm so excited to be able to share what Indiana has been doing and kind of hope that other states can learn. Um, and that's just what I'd like to add. And thank you to um, Ali Joe and to Karen, and then also to Miranda Spitznagel, who I know was part was interviewed as part of the case study as well, but because of um, other issues, wasn't able to join us. But if you've got any other questions you'd like to add, um, or we can move on to the polling question that we're asking everybody to help us kind of see what you've learned from this. Yeah, absolutely. Ready for you and Ruth to wrap us up? Okay, Ruth, I'll turn it back over to you. So if everybody can just click on, you know, if you can ask about kind of what your knowledge is about standing orders, 
now that you've heard the presentation and we're able to um, ask some questions, um, we can do that. And we'd also like to let you know that we're going to be, um, if you've submitted a question but we didn't get, um, we didn't have time to answer it, we will work on answering that. That is good. Ruth? Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, so really, again, we appreciate you very much for participating today. I do want to thank Claire Brockbank and Michelle Paterina for, for Paterino, rather, for leading us through this conversation, um, Karen Hudman and Allie Joe Shipman for um, really helping share their experiences with us today. And just offer that um, the Long Association is here. If you have additional questions, um, please check out our case study that will be going out um, as we wrap up with a, a final um, email after today's webcast. So you will have that if you haven't already. But please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions at all. And so um, be safe and healthy. And thank you so much for your participation today. This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect.